Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. We can hear you. Nice, nice. Uh, very nice to meet you. My name is Michiel. Um, I'm one of the programmers of the film festival. Nice uh, and we will have a short talk. Thanks a lot for making time. So, uh, very nice to meet you, Elsa Kremser and uh, Levin Peter. Am I pronouncing it correctly? Thanks. Uh, the two directors of Space Dogs. We are showing your film in the uh, section, the official section. Um, new voices uh, and we're very happy to, to talk about, uh, to you today. Uh, maybe the first question we have is uh, how have you been coping with this new world that all of a sudden we are all living in? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> this new world. <laughs> <laughs> this new world, okay. I, I thought you, me you meant the, the new world of uh, dogs in Moscow. No, you mean- No, no, no. I mean uh, the, the new world that all of a sudden we're, we're thrown upon. Yeah, first of all, I, I, mean, I mean, I try not to accept it as a, as a new world. I, I think like a lot of people, I like to try to ignore much of it, try to see it as something that will pass and I will wake up one day and, and it's, it's all over. Yeah, regarding the film, of course, it's a, it's a pity. We were lucky we had several real life screenings uh, and festivals, which is such a big difference. It's a, of course, it's a good thing that now also the film is available to a wider audience in a way because people don't have to be in Ghent, for example, or in Vienna, they can live somewhere in the countryside and see the film. But at the same time, we made this film really for the big screen, for the cinema. So if someone has a Beamer at home, it's great. But if you watch it on the laptop, it's a different experience because we always were visioning this in, in huge size that the dogs are bigger than humans. And now on a phone or a laptop, it's the, the other way around. So yeah. It's and a meeting people <laughs> to be honest in real have you you traveled ever since the the whole COVID-19 crisis started yeah I mean we we had like several how many maybe four festivals in in, in August September that were happening I mean in a completely different way um, but in real, like as hybrid festivals, part partly real, part online, there were limited like number of, of also filmmaker guests, and yeah, we traveled to three three festivals, I think. And just recently, we had the German cinema release with a yeah. nine day travel through kind of all, all directions of, of Germany. And I mean, coming to coming back to your question. In this like cinema release tour we recently had in, in Germany, we we really encountered what cinema means um, after this like lockdowns and in different places and the regulations are very different and also people are often very shy and and precautious coming to to cinemas and uh, we we understand all of it but we also encountered like what it means for local cinemas to to still run their places and and still try to try to bring their films to the to the audience so this was this was an encounter with this new world you were speaking of this was completely different than any experience we had before we felt like really isolated sitting in the train jumping off going to the cinema everything was arranged very nice but the atmosphere was was strange and and touching to see like how our field of work is affected when it comes to the last point to the encounter with the audience. So this was quite an experience, but. Of course, you know. it's heartbreaking if you're in a cinema which is supposed to be for 200 people and then it's sold out with 20 people in the audience. And there are, is a line outside who cannot go and watch it. Hmm. Yeah, at the moment we are uh, selling uh, the capacity of our, of our theaters is at uh, 50% with a maximum of 200 people in Belgium at the moment. Um, so still, that, that's a lot in comparison. Yeah, yeah, in comparison to other countries, it's, it's quite okay. Yeah, definitely. 
Um, but we can see uh, we can see at the ticket sales um, for the people who are watching this now. This was recorded one week before the festival, uh, and we can see at the from the ticket sales that people really hunger for um, for cinema. They right. want to go back to the to the theater. So that's really positive to see at yeah. the moment. <laughs> it's amazing to hear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. Maybe. Um, Let's talk about Space Dogs a bit. Um, you've made a, a truly special, special film, a really special film, um, a very uh, difficult watch um, also. Um, it's very touching at the same time. I, 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 I asked myself, what was the first spark for, for this film? It's, it's, it's hard to imagine. Was it, was it Laika, the dog that went to space or <laughs> yeah, in the beginning, we just had this idea to make a very different animal film. Uh, we wanted to, the, the, the dogs were quite early in our discussion since, since years already before we started to actually make these films. We, we always thought there must be a way to make a film just with dogs as the main characters, and which is not a nature doc and not Lassie or Beethoven or Disney. Yes. It was always the, this idea. And then we thought, okay, it should be a pack of strays. And we want to be inside of this pack. And then we had these very vague images in mind, which were really leading through all out of the production, um, which were just the idea of a 10 minute sequence inspired by Carlos Regada's opening sequence of Post and Evas Luz, where we thought, okay, just shadows and noises and a child's or dog's or animal's perspective with open eyes watching and listening and a very physical thing. So this was the starting point. And then, yeah, we researched and thought about dogs in general in history. And when we found out that Laika was actually born on the streets, which we did not know before, it was like a, yeah, this initial somehow thought that we knew, okay, now that now we have this story we want to tell and the approach, how we include the narration humans are used to, to get about animals and to somehow ch change it, shift it, and let it collide with the real world of dogs. So it, it started out with these, with these images, um, which I think you managed quite well. Um, the, 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 the images that you made with the dogs in, in, in Moscow are truly amazing. And while watching it, how did you do it is, is basically the, the, the mm -hmm. simple way that I can ask the question like was there a special equipment designed for it did you have, have to gain the trust of the dogs that kind of stuff yeah I mean and on, on different levels it, it was um, all invented for the film like first maybe technically speaking um, it was not a a very complicated setup. We we had to try a lot of different camera techniques, like that allowed Yunus Royemer, the DOP, to be on this eye level with the dogs, like to to be flexible enough with a five people crew uh, running at night after the dogs, like to to be fast enough, to be flexible enough, not to to have it too heavy. This was one point, and on the on the other hand, there was the like the aesthetic layer. We we never wanted the camera to to really fly like with a steady cam. Mm -hmm. We wanted the camera really to imitate in a way the, the the very unique rhythm dogs are having when they walk. It's soft, but it's also shaky at the same time. It's it's really special how they move. Yeah. So. We tried also like steady cam kind of setups and other rigs and, and complicated things. And in the end, it became something very simple, but it was not easy to find it. Um, it was like a handle above the camera body and between the handle and the body, there was a very tiny stabilization system that was automatically like uh, gaining the horizon, like that the horizon was always steady. This was designed for boats. Yeah, <laughs> filming on boats. It's for, for shooting on. Okay, okay. And this was simple, but it took a while. And um, then it was an eight, eight kilo camera that Roy had to carry. We put a lot in his backpack, everything that we can. 
this like for the technical part, but more like emotionally speaking, of course we had to spend, let's say eight, nine weeks with the dogs until it happened like you saw it in the film, until the dogs were not focusing on us anymore, until they allowed us to follow, they suddenly started to, to wait for us. When they were running in the street, let's say, and they realized, ah, no, the crew is not, not fast enough, they really started to wait. So we became, a, let's say, a big pack, and they accepted us, and they somehow were interested in this attention we gave them. And I would even say they enjoyed this attention and they somehow fulfilled this amazing, like not amazing, but this, this big platform we gave them. So in a human language, in a human way of thinking, you can say they became actors and they fulfilled their role. And this, everything I talked about was a development of, yeah, two months maybe. And then we were able to really shoot for another month. And everything you've seen in the film is just the last month of shooting. So this is maybe the secret behind it that um, they somehow understood the situation for themselves and just used it in their best way. And maybe this sounds very, very wisely planned, but mm -hmm. it, it was not because we went there with the full seriousness of okay, we now start to shoot in the mm. middle of winter and we took it super serious and we tried and it, we failed and we thought we succeeded already in between. Uh, and in this way, we, we made this connection that we talked about and also the technical improvements. But then we just threw away all this material in the editing room, which was tough, obviously, because we, it was not a tryout. It was not a test. It was a real shooting and we just had to get rid of it in the editing. Yeah. And they were just random dogs. How, how did, you, did you pick the dogs? You just went on the streets, a random corner, and, and they were there? Or they were famous in the neighborhoods? Or No, actually, uh, we, we really made a casting. Before okay. shooting, uh, we, we made an intensive research, also already with the DLP, where we made tests, real tests, uh, with other camera systems. And then we met plenty of packs, dog packs, maybe 30, 50 different kind of groups and we tried with them like photos, test shootings, just approaching and watching them. And yeah, in this research, we found this area and part of the dogs that you actually now see in the film. But the young one, the main hero was not yet born. When we came back for the shooting, he was a, a very young dog and he was new to the group. And we saw, okay, this, this guy, he has to explore life because he's young, he, he doesn't know anything and he has to find his place in the pack. Mm -hmm. and so uh, really gained our interest. It's 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 interesting how you yeah you 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 call them actors in your film, but at some point it almost seems like they are directing the whole film and, and pulling the strings mm. because they lead the way in, in in some way. How how hard was that to to let your movie be be led or guided by by this pack of dogs? Yeah, I, I mean this is really a paradox because. We we enjoy documentaries so much where this is happening. In a lot of documentaries that we like, it's very obvious in the beginning that there was a, was a certain idea by the director or by the directress. Like this is sometimes very obvious, like the motivation to do it and, and the whole approach. And then on one point, these films like fall apart because life becomes bigger. Mm -hmm. and everything becomes much more meaningful and, and much more rich than, than what it was actually meant to be. But this you can, of course, never plan. You can only wish. And we wished for a lot, yeah, that this actually yes, is happening. a lot, yeah. yeah. But it was never hard to let them go, like to let them lead the film. And, and also there were some critics that that pointed out this, exactly this moment in the film where you really think like, no, they are ruling the whole city. So just imagine Moscow is also a Moscow of the dogs and it's their world too. Mm -hmm. And this was always our main goal. And I mean, we were standing there for days and nights and, and hoping so much to, for, for things to happen because they sleep 80% of the time. Like most of the dog's life is sleeping. It's not, not much 
time of the day that they're really like running around and, and do things. So we were happy about every narrative that popped up and, and every walk. Yeah. <laughs> so no, it, it was never hard to to let them take over. No. Well, when you you talk about the the critic that said the dogs are king of of Moscow, are you talking about the one the one scene that that obviously we we have to ask a question about the, the scene with the cat? No, this was more in general. In general, in like, general, okay, okay. But also point on this point, uh, many critics described that there it's turning around. And to be honest, in this moment, the the thing mainly happened also for us during the shooting. Because this was a shock in the first moment, obviously. Um, but then we discussed so much what was actually happening, and uh, this was so intense and so important for the film because mm -hmm. we we knew okay, it's not in our control. It, they control the situation, and we are shocked as humans. But they are not shocked at all. It's something very normal for them. Mm -hmm. Did you did, did you realize? When it happened, like we have to put this in the film, or was it after discussions? Mm, I mean, what as I described maybe is more our emotion during the the shooting, mm -hmm. and that after the after after this happened, which was a long morning when when it happened, because we also continued to film them after they killed the cat, because we we found it very important to see like if they behave different or, or what what's in their like what's in their face is the expression different but there was no difference of, at all of course it yeah. was just our projection and then after this we've been sitting for i mean for hours together all the crew and these discussions we had that this was very important for the for the rest of the shooting because we realized that uh yeah exactly something happened that was out of our control and and we were in the first time of the shooting we really had to have a very clear um i don't know what i don't know <laughs> <laughs> it's, a it's, a, it's a missing word in english yeah we i mean we had to have a very clear thought on this to 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 make it safe. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. The moment uh, in in this discussion it was also clear for us that this has to be part of the film because it was so important uh, what we saw and what we saw also on the image. We watched it directly uh, also to check how it is and how it is seen, which impression it makes. Because for us, it was a shock, but it was a shock from a dis different perspective. Like the whole film we saw from normal human eyes from the, up there, but only the camera saw it from down there. We had monitors during the shoot, but they lost connection during the scene, so partly. So we did not really follow during the shooting and later on we saw it at home. We said, okay, this is special. We don't know this. We know so many killings in animal dogs, like the lion in the, kills the gazelle and so on. But this is very, very different because we are somehow part of this group and we are witnessing something so close that we are not outsiders with a zoom lens and saying this is nature, but we're somehow involved and these are house animals. So mm -hmm. it means something so different to us humans and this actually hits a core about the discussion, how, how we humans relate to animals, how we think about them, how we tell stories with them. And so it was clear, yeah, it's inside the, inside the film, but the main issue was where to put it in the film and how to work with that dramaturgically. I think it's, it's, it's wonderfully placed. Um, it's really a, an important turning point for the film or, or it, makes, it makes sense uh, to, yeah, it's, it's it's really well done. It's shocking, of course, but but it really works. This was not easy later in the editing. I guess um, not all all feedback must have been very very positive or very oh. <laughs> no. We get a lot of uh, bad feedback also on that, but. In discussions, of, of course, we are super interested what makes the people angry about the scene so much. And in a way we found out it's, uh, it's a problem with their projections so much because they want to have these animals safe. And often we are asked why did, we did not stop, stop this situation. Yeah. 
But then I always wonder because when I, of course, I do not tell them directly in this way. Um, but I wonder if you know dogs and if you were made, because I was growing up with dogs and if they are really in this mode, what should you do? It's not our dog and we were never controlling him or stopping him from anything, eating garbage, barking at, for, at people, at strangers who were passing by and they were super afraid and we've been so close with these dogs, but they were attacking them and we could not help anyone with these dogs because, yeah, mm -hmm. they were wild in a way. And so in this situation, we never had the, the thought it was so fast that we could do anything or change the situation. So this is one point many people are blaming us for that we did not help the cat. And in the same time, it's like, yeah, people are so used to have the cat at home and the dog at home. And if the, then I always wonder, no, but cats, it's a usual thing that they kill mice and bring it to the owner as a present. Dogs kill chickens in the countryside. And it's something supposed to be natural, farm life, back to the roots. And mm -hmm. this is good. <laughs> but this, what you see in there is, yeah, obviously it's not a good thing, but I wouldn't name it a bad thing, to be honest. Yeah, people have a very special emotional connection to, to, to house animals. And of course, then it's, it's shock, shocking to see something like that. Because we really experienced over the last year. Also and, the definition you know. of uh, cat persons and dog persons. I was <laughs> dog, with a dog film. We own a cat since more than 10 years. So I, I yeah, I'm maybe a animal person, even if I don't know what that means. I like animals and like to watch them and be with them. But, but yeah, I, I prefer not to decide for good animals or bad animals or important ones or not important ones. Mm -hmm. it's always also, it was a goal that we, or it was very nice that uh, in one screening there came a, a lady to us and told us after the cinema, she went out and she saw ants and she looked at them super different because they also have their world, you know? And so it's I like because we just step on the ant and no one cares, but maybe they are also, their lives are super exciting. We don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Maybe the next film should be in the, the hallways of the ants. Um, I wanted to, to flip, we have on one side, we have the dogs uh, in Moscow and the other side, we have the, the archi archive footage. Um, I, I wanted to ask you about it because I, I, I did some research and, and you went to Moscow as well for this footage, which was never before shown. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this came all out of one institute um, it's not an archive, it's, it's really an institute. And in this institute, the dogs were trained more than 60 years ago. Mm -hmm. and, uh, this facility is still running. They work with uh, ISS cosmonauts, with Russians. And it's really a particular work dedicated to a niche, to, to all like issues that you could call medical issues that are connected to space travel and our organism and, and weightlessness and um, yeah and so many things that we don't know much about but it's a very interesting place and they had filled the dogs in a much brighter scale than broader scale than, than we thought so it was the only facility that we researched that really filmed uh, material that was never shown for a reason because it's it's not easy to watch it's it's a document it's not made for public so this was the main difference we found a lot of other mark archive material that was made to educate to show to uh, to to celebrate and and to celebrate the enrichment and and everything they gained, but this was really just to, yeah, just a document for for the inner circle. And um, yeah, it was not easy to get on one point. Very early, we found out that this place is existing. Then we even found out they have this, this material, but we had to discuss with them over three years until they finally allowed us to to see it to and to save it because it was in a bad condition and it was one part of our agreement that we take care of the yeah. of, um, restoring. of the film restoring and digitization. 
So, so you, you digitalized the, the material that you saw. Okay, and where, where is it now? Is It's in an archive open to, to no. new people? No, just... No, it's just uh, with us. Okay. <laughs> and at their place. And at their place. Okay. Somewhere there in the... <laughs> wow. All the material, and it was for them also important because they, they actually, they did not take care about this material. It was like, are these old dog things? No one is interested and maybe animal activists will be aggressive if it's in some TV documentary or anything. So that's why they didn't want to give it away, obviously, but they didn't have a proper film archive place. They just had a basement with not the best uh, conditions. So it was kind of already starting to fall apart. We made all this process of water bath and to restore everything. And then we gave them back the hard drive with their material in a good condition. And also the film reels are now restored. So in an end, they're wet again and, and in a good, yeah, restored, which is also for them in the end was like, ah, yeah, it would have been a pity if it's lost, but they, I think they did not think about saving this mm -hmm. because for them it was, it's just not important because they are now, they would now want to go to Mars with humans and the old stories are old stories. Yeah, and they are scientists and in this whole discussion, this was uh, the main issue, like, they had their scientific access to this material, to the whole like experiment with the dogs, and and we had we had cinematic interest and and an aesthetic view towards it, mm. and this two point of view they 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 very often do not match, and um, was it just took a while to come to a common common ground and. And also language in a way, yeah, to understand each other. Do the two of you speak any any Russian or? Um, actually, until the film was finished, nearly nothing, to be honest. Now, as we make two more films in uh, Russian language region, at least, um, mm -hmm. we are planning also a first fiction with uh, people who are who will talk, not just dogs. So we are learning now. The material that we see, the archive material. Um, you put the, the the spectator in a very similar place position as the the dogs kind of by 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 showing the experiments, but we have no clue why all this cruel stuff is going on. Um, what was your your reasoning behind that? Yeah, to be honest, in the first place, we received this material. Of course, we read before many scientific notes. But when we watched this material, we kind of forgot or did not take care about what we knew and mm -hmm. just saw these images silent because there was no sound coming with the material. And it was so touching to see this just and it was repetitive because they made several copies on one reel. And it was in a way so abstract and so futuristic that we thought this is maybe more the core of what happened then actually if you are really going into the historical details and we wanted to get rid of the historical details in general it was not a, our approach to make a yeah you can read it in books voilà. yeah. we wanted to make something for cinema and where you can really maybe understand more what we are doing and not not what we did or what those people actually exactly did back then and also regarding facts, we talked to several time witnesses and the facts are a thing in, in all this uh, storytelling in, in Cold War. Um, it, it's hard to find out what is actually really, really true uh, and what really happened. And I think in the images, you can see at least something very true because the stories we heard, they are going from there to there. It's so, so many differences in what exactly, when, why happened or not. So that's why we also use this, this fairy tale to surround all this because there is no real truth, especially not for the dogs. You, you, you um, use a very, very uh, great narrator, uh, the Russian actor. Um, why did you choose him? He has a very special voice. He's, he's, he's a perfect fit. Because of this. Because of this? Yeah, 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 he was he was the Russian voice that inspired us the most. Uh, it was beautiful as soon as we knew he's interested to work with us. We even changed part of the narrative. It, it was enriching our process of writing a lot because when you have this voice, you have a character, 
you have really a, a life behind. And um, this was the main reason why we chose him because we, we, we were listening to a lot of other Russian actors, but that's the thing with actors, maybe in general, to my mind, when you don't see them and just listen to them, they are much more acting. I, I hardly like listening just to the voice of actors because I, I, I can really, uh, literally speaking, I can see them acting, mm -hmm. like fear at the stage. So it's much too much for me. It's, it's like um, too overacted very often. And this, we, this problem we had with a lot of Russian actors that we were like listening to. And with him, it was really different. And he's simply famous for this. He's one of the most famous Russian actors, but also people really love him because he's the guy next door. He could be the bandit of the 90s. He could be uh, the crazy father of someone. He, he, yeah, he, he could be everyone. And he's, Russians consider him as really authentic. Mm -hmm. and I think all this was, uh, yeah, truly important for us. Also that we thought this voice could be the voice of a, of a scientist that was long forgotten and now he speaks, speaks off the first time he's raising his voice, but he's never judging. And this is another thing. Very often you have this toy, tone of actors and they, they somehow always judge because of the tonation. And you always think, no, they give too much of a color inside. But he is a cosmic voice. He's not, he's not too much into it. Like he's just telling us um, what, yeah, what he's thinking. And in addition to that, Alexei Serebrakov is uh, also privately, he has a very special relation to Russia. He, he's now living in Canada. He's still working in Russia, but he's a, he has a special role and a special view on, on politics too, even if it's not a political okay. role, but slightly it might be for some people who, who listen in detail. And so also this position of the real person behind the actor, it was something important for us. We don't, didn't want to have just a random actor from somewhere we don't know. So we also like his biography a lot and especially Leviathan where we stumbled upon him, yeah. Hmm. Did he help write you the, help, help write the, the voiceover or was it all written by you? Like some minor changes. Changes, yeah. We wrote it in German uh, okay. originally and then had a, a writer, like a poem writer from who is living in Berlin, who is from Moscow and she made the the basis of the translation and we worked a lot with our assistant who followed the film for several years and then he came and then it was uh, another work to how to speak it then we made okay. some more changes but yeah all right great um i'm always interested it's the last question as there's two directors how does the the collaboration work between you two fluent and I mean <laughs> it's hard to speak about it because we never see us from the outside for us it's the most natural thing we do films since 10 years mm -hmm. um, this is the first time that we both direct and both produce before we had something like that. we had different roles but this is not so important important is that we see uh, our work now as a work of a duo as a directing duo, this comes in a lot of fields of arts. It's always a field of interest for a lot of other people. And we always in this moment have to step back a bit and, and reflect on it because in our daily life, it's the most natural thing. We that, never think about it. We don't yeah. discuss about that too much, to be honest. I mean, if I reflect, then I see that I, when I compare space dogs and the whole like process of the film, when I compare it to previous films where I was directing more or less alone and as I was producing and writing with me together, then I don't know, this self-reflectiveness uh, was always a problem. And I see now in Space Dogs that we, we encouraged each other much more to be more radical. Okay. So this is almost more most of radical film we made because we, when you're together, we allow yourself, I think in our case, more to 
to not to concentrate too much on other opinions, but just like really trust on on what how we understand cinema together. Yeah. Also, if you have uh, in the first moment maybe stupid ideas, like okay, let's uh, put turtles on the street of Moscow. Why not? If you're alone, it might happen depending on the character that you think. Yeah, I don't know what an idea. I'm not sure, and maybe you put it away. And, but if you're two, you yeah, we we talk about everything very quickly without shaming of very banal and stupid first ideas and then we also throw together uh, we throw away things together and we think no really not but sometimes through this process of telling each other every stupid thing you even in front of yourself you at least try to uh, start to express one thought you maybe are too shy to express it for, for yourself mm -hmm. this is an advantage i see and it's a lot of fun to exchange yeah I mean, the, the result is def definitely, a, a, like you said, a radical film and a film that keeps surprising at every corner. Um, it's, 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 it's a bit of a roller coaster ride. Um, and I hope the audience uh, on the VOD platform, but as well in the theaters, really uh, enjoys the film. I want to thank you for, for taking your time. I don't know if there's anything that you want to add, maybe? No, I mean, it's, it's just great to hear that you provide both, that people, like we said in the beginning, can, can, can either go to the, to the cinema or watch it at home. And this is like giving, giving us hope too. Ah, yeah. And one last thing, because you have this, uh, your special music, uh, film music focus. We also produced the soundtrack of the film on vinyl. Yeah. Okay. Record, so it's available on our website for ordering if someone is interested. There is, the, of course, the score, but also some narrator parts and some experiment, experimental tracks that are not part of the film, like a, a choir of dogs in Moscow. <laughs> is it on? Uh, I'm asking for myself because I don't have a vinyl player. But is it on the streaming platform as well? No, on, yeah. on several, yeah. Like band yeah. and and. and. Spotify. Spotify everywhere, Apple Music. And, yeah. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Yeah.